Brexit thrown into disarray as the UK Foreign Secretary resigns over Theresa May's handling of negotiations. I'm Imran Garta and today's newsmaker is the British Prime Minister. Boris Johnson's departure could mean that the Brexit tide is changing in Britain. But in what direction? Hardliners such as Johnson want total independence from Europe. They've criticized May for pushing to keep a number of trade deals intact. With his resignation, the eighth by a minister since November, May could face a leadership challenge. And Johnson could be hoping Downing Street becomes his new home. But the move might blow up in his face, because now the four top posts in May's government are held by ministers who voted to stay in the EU. So, did Johnson hand May a death blow or a gift? Haider Abbasi reports. What started out as a setback for Brexit talks quickly turned into a crisis for British Prime Minister Theresa May. In just 24 hours, three ministers have quit her government. First, the minister negotiating Britain's exit from the European Union, David Davis, followed by his deputy, Steve Baker, and then Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson. Two years ago, he was the face of the Leave campaign. They've all resigned for the same reason, Theresa May's trade plan with the EU. On Friday, the plan was approved by the Prime Minister's cabinet. In his resignation letter, Davis says May's proposed policies would leave us in at best a weak negotiating position with the EU. And in Johnson's letter to the Prime Minister, he says, We appear to be heading for a semi-Brexit, with large parts of the economy still locked in the EU system. Both believe May's approach would be a betrayal of the EU referendum results. But she's not backing down. In the two years since the referendum, we have had a spirited national debate <laughs> with, with robust views echoing around the cabinet table as they have on breakfast tables up and down the country. Over that time, I've listened to every possible idea and every possible version of Brexit. Mr Speaker, this is the right Brexit. Opposition leader Jeremy Corbyn has taken the chance to exploit the chaos. We have a crisis in government Two secretaries of state have resigned and still we're no clearer on what future relationship with our nearest neighbours and biggest partners will look like. Workers and businesses deserve better than this. David Davis and Boris Johnson wanted a clean break from the EU or a hard Brexit. That would mean Britain would leave the single market which allows the free movement of goods, services and people within the EU. A hard Brexit would also mean Britain would leave the customs union. The union allows members to buy and sell from each other without paying import taxes. And they all charge the same taxes on goods coming into the union from abroad. The trade plan put forward by Theresa May means Britain will still follow some of these rules. The government says the plan would allow for easy trade at the border a soft Brexit would mean an end to the free movement of people into Britain, but EU citizens would be able to enter for work or study. For the hardline Brexiteers, this is simply not enough. There's now talk of a vote of no confidence in Prime Minister Theresa May. Eight cabinet ministers have resigned since November. The crisis hasn't gone unnoticed in Brussels. Politicians come and go. But the problems they have created for the people remain and the mess caused by Brexit is the biggest problem in the history of EU-UK relations. And it is still very far from being solved, with or without Mr Davies. Britain only has until March to leave the bloc, and time is running out to reach a deal with the EU. But with her own cabinet in revolt, can Theresa May's government deliver? Haider Abbasi, The Newsmakers. Well, to discuss this, I'm joined now from London by Lee Jasper. He's a political strategist and Labour Party activist. Also in the UK, we have Tom Brooks. He's the dean at Durham Law School. And in London, we have Philip Blonde. He's a commentator on economics for Respublica, a conservative think tank. Gentlemen, I, I thank you all for joining us here on the Newsmakers. Lee Jasper, let me start with you. What do you make of Boris Johnson's resignation? Did he make the right decision? Is it, I guess, in a way, 
good for the UK that he's resigned? Well, it's certainly good for Boris Johnson uh, seeking to position himself uh, uh, in relation to uh, taking uh, uh, the prime minister's job, ultimately. Uh, so I don't think we can be fooled by uh, the explanation that Boris Johnson resigned on principle. Uh, had it been a principle issue, he would have resigned at Chequers on Friday night, if not uh, in the run-up uh, to that meeting. He left it. He left it until after David Davis uh, resigned and was dragged into resignation. This uh, uh, Boris Johnson resignation is all about securing the interests of Boris Johnson, uh, not the nation uh, and certainly not the Tory party. OK, so, Philip, we're hearing from Lee that... This is not principled. However, reading the man's resignation letter, he's saying we're truly headed for the status of a colony. The dream is dying, suffocated by needless self-doubt. Has Lee been a bit unfair on Johnson? Was Johnson really and sincerely in favour of a hard Brexit? And he felt that, I don't know, Theresa May was just selling out. Uh, I don't know if Boris Johnson is sincerely and consistently in, in favour of any one thing. Um, so I think, I think Boris Johnson going in one sense is neither here nor there because what it effectively does is strengthen the hand of Theresa May. So on the one hand, we have a prime minister that's called weak, but she keeps lasting because those who want to remove her are weaker than she is. And she's got, now got a much more unified cabinet. She's got a deal behind which that cabinet has unified that she wishes to put to the European Union. Doubtless there'll be further changes, but it seems very difficult for the Brexiteers to now do very much about it because they lack the numbers, apparently, to cause a leadership election. They've got no guarantee that one of their own, a Brexiteer, will become um, leader. And they themselves, because of the deal that's been struck in Parliament, now only realistically have the option of forcing a crash out um, right. uh, of the EU without a deal. And it's not clear that they'd necessarily want to do that either. So there's no majority in Parliament for any one course. Yep. And generally speaking, that means that the Prime Minister's course may well yet win through. Tom, what I find really interesting is Philip saying, you know, the Brexiteers, the Brexiteers, they've been weakened and so forth. Brexit is happening, as far as I'm aware, with, you know, two years down the line. Is the entire notion of Brexit now under question or just the method of Brexit is just going to be far more soft and a compromise between the European Union and Theresa May's government? Well, I think, you know, Theresa May said that Brexit means Brexit um, a couple of years ago, and we've still been trying to work out exactly what those uh, words mean. Um, after almost two years of, of, of waiting to find out, she only the other day, uh, for the only time, gets her cabinet together to discuss what their collective view will be. 48 hours later, the person who led the Vote Leave successful campaign <laughs> leaves saying this isn't Brexit to him. And the person who is politically in charge of, uh, as Brexit secretary, leaves saying he doesn't think this is the Brexit himself uh, either. I, I think that she's got herself a, a real mess because I think um, the, the nature of compromise, you know, the nature of trying to win over different factions, whether it be in the Tory party, whether it be uh, across the country, uh, seems to be, it, it is definitely a tall order. And I think it's a given that uh, everyone's going to be disappointed. I think leavers and remainers alike will be uh, disappointed. Perhaps her hand is strengthened in a, in a cabinet uh, right now that is a bit more uh, uh, to her liking for, for today. There may well be more resignations happening mm -hmm. soon, but I don't think her hand is strengthened in, in Parliament. She now has more uh, enemies on, uh, who are now uh, wishing to see this deal fall. There'll be lots of others in other parties wanting to see this deal uh, fall. And if there was a way of, 
of, of making some type of change, then, then perhaps that will happen. I mean, I think that what she means by Brexit and illusory mm -hmm. customs deals and other types of things isn't what Boris means by Brexit. It's not what Nigel Farage means by Brexit. It's not what anyone, uh, not what George Galloway has meant by Brexit. You know, left, right, right. center, up, down, diagonal. This is not anyone's Brexit. Two years on, nobody knows what Brexit means. And that's fascinating and I guess a lesson <laughs> in itself. Lee, for those, the, there are those who believe that she was selling out on trade and she was going too soft and diluting Brexit, those hard Brexiteers, as we would call them. Now, they're out of the way by their own choice. They, they resigned. If you were the European Commission, Lee, what would you do next? I'd tell Britain to go back to the drawing board because I'm absolutely sure mm. that uh, this existential crisis for the Tory party, ripped asunder as it is uh, on the issue of uh, Europe, is going to return with a vengeance when the European Parliament uh, uh, and uh, Claude Juncker rejects uh, the substantive proposals uh, as outlined in the Chequers Accord. It's all right having unity, but when you have a unity uh, of a government around a position that is not likely to survive uh, as an objective reality, then all you're doing is kicking the can further down the road. We've had two years, two whole years since the referendum, in which Theresa May and all the others have had plenty of time to think about, uh, r run through the scenarios, test the models, come up with a plan that works for Britain. They've not been able to do so, not because of, of any political strife within uh, the Tory party necessarily in itself, but the sheer edifice of disentanglement of economic, cultural, policy, legislation uh, uh, from Europe is such a behemoth, such an edifice of bureaucracy that even the civil servants have said to them, even if we had a full complement of civil servants, it'd probably still take us 25 years to work through these complex scenarios. So I think Brexit, uh, the, the Chequers plan is dead, that they've unified around a position that ultimately will be rejected. And uh, although she may last until the summer, I am sure that when uh, the European Party Parliament responds in October later this year, this will return to haunt uh, Theresa May. Philip, I'm guessing you disagree that this position will be rejected by the Europeans. It's the beginning of the dialogue, and I think that what May has done is she started to define Brexit, and it means that we have some sort of common alignment for goods, which is only 20% of the economy, and we don't have yet have any agreement for services. So this is actually what an agreement looks like. And the point is, is that... Um, and it's nowhere near the an agreement. biggest majority in Parliament... The, the biggest majority in Parliament is against no deal. Now, Parliament has the ability to vote down whatever deal Theresa May comes up with, but then the alternative is only no deal. So we are going to get a deal, and Theresa May... Uh, currently looks like the ones who'll be able to deliver it, depending on, on securing the wider agreement uh, in Parliament, which I think she will get. So I repeat, mm. she is now in a stronger position than she was, mainly because her enemies are in now in a much weaker position. The Tory party don't have an alternative. They don't have an alternative plan they all agree on, and they certainly don't have an alternative leader that they all right. agree on. And they fear that if they keep engaging in internal dispute, they will just leave the door open for the Labour Party, which itself doesn't right. have a settled Philip, view on is, Brexit either. Why is, why is Labour so happy? I mean, if this has really strengthened her, why is the Labour Party mm. jumping for joy right now, or at least Labour members and Labour supporters? Well, I think they see, they see division and consternation, and generally that helps the opposing party. But I don't think it's anything like a level that would guarantee Labour success. I still think that uh, Theresa May has shown extraordinary tenacity, and I think that post-Brexit, um, the, uh, the Conservative Party can hand over to a new leader who can come up with the type of visionary agenda that's needed to speak to the needs of the people who voted for Brexit. So I would still think the Conservative Party, mm. uh, against uh, a Labour Party led by Jeremy Corbyn, are still likely to win the next general election. 
So I think everybody's uh, celebrations or misery, they're all overdone. I think right. the, the most likely outcome but is that May will eventually deliver on some form of the deal that she already uh, has agreed at Chequers. So it isn't dead by any means. OK, and going to Tom in Durham. Tom, for those who look at it from the outside and say if the Foreign Secretary has resigned and you've had a spate of resignations, is the leadership of the Prime Minister in question? Is she possibly, is her head possibly on the chopping block? Your answer is what? Well, I think she is in serious trouble. I take the point that there's not very serious um, uh, contenders, or so it might look uh, right now. But there, um, but I think people, uh, uh, you know, uh, people will rise to the occasion. There are folks right now who are popular uh, with uh, conservative party uh, members. Uh, there are people who are popular with uh, members of parliament uh, right now. Some uh, there are names that are being talked about and secretive leadership uh, bids and all but name uh, uh, launched right now. So I, I think that it's, it's, it's not quite clear that, that she is as, as strong and as happy and as wonderful as has as been said. I mean, so she's starting a dialogue. She's starting a dialogue right now in the middle of July. She's giving it not even 90 days to have some agreement with the Europeans before it's just too late to have any deal to vote up or down. She's putting all of her eggs in a basket that her Brexit secretary and foreign secretary have rejected, as have others at that meeting, at least anecdotally, um, that we've had reports from who said the same things uh, that we now know are confirmed true, uh, said from David Davis and Boris Johnson. And I, I, I think that to say, well, at least she's got a deal and there's no real alternative or time for other parties to come up with something, so therefore she's going to get her way. I think this is just the worst of all possible outcomes at the worst possible time. And if I was the European Commission and I was uh, looking at this, I would agree with Lee. I'd say uh, to uh, the Prime Minister to go back to the drawing board, because uh, I don't think that Britain crashing out and Britain having a big uh, implosion in front of our eyes in such spectacular fashion like this is in the interest of Britain, nor is it in the interest of the European Union. I think that the Prime Minister needs to hold her hand up and take responsibility for uh, coming to this far too late. She should have had this meeting before she triggered uh, Article 50. Mm -hmm. She should have been doing this certainly uh, a year or so or more ago. But she is in the position that she's in. They're now starting to think a little bit more seriously than they were before about what happens. They have a fanciful uh, plan here that uh, wouldn't convince uh, any, uh, anyone I know uh, who is serious, especially on customs and borders in Ireland. And I think um, you know, she's going to need more time, and I think she should beg and ask for it effectively. OK. Lee Jasper. Because if she doesn't have it, right. we're in real trouble. OK. Lee Jasper, 29th of March 2019. That's the agreed-upon deadline. All of this has to get done by then. I, I know you're a Labour man. I know you're a Remainer. What kind of deal would you accept by then where they can come to you and say, OK, we're formally leaving the European Union, but this is how we're going to do it? What kind of deal would you accept? Well, we'd want one that uh, certainly protects, uh, uh, prioritises the protection of jobs uh, uh, and the economy. And that's got to be within the uh, context of a, uh, a, uh, uh, a single market uh, and the customs union. And so we've got to have a, a deal from Europe that facilitates not only the democratic wishes of the public who voted, from my perspective at least, uh, with a great deal of uh, lack of information, with uh, 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 propaganda uh, from the other side, uh, lies written on the side of buses. Uh, this is the, this is the uh, campaign that led to the yes vote. But if uh, we are to have uh, uh, this Brexit, then it has to be one that protects jobs and services. And currently what we're seeing from... Uh, uh, the Chequers uh, meeting, is a plan and a proposal that is ultimately uh, going to be rejected. Maybe not in, in whole, but certainly in, some mm. of, in terms of the substantive part, certainly on the issues of free movement, certainly on the issues of regulatory alignment uh, and so on. That uh, right. you're either in the European Union or you're not. You, Britain is not going to get no special deal. Britain exceptionalism is a myth. Britain thinks it's more powerful than it actually is. And uh, the Prime Minister has been happy to indulge the public in those fallacies, uh, which all have now become into sharp relief as we tick-tock the end of that political clock 
which says we've got to get this deal done uh, by uh, March next year. Right. Well, I've been covering this for, what, two and a half years in the build-up to the referendum and beyond the mm. referendum. We've done multiple shows on this, and I can tell you all, gentlemen, it's one of those stories that gets less clear as you go along. It becomes more and more <laughs> nebulous. <laughs> you can chew on that. Seriously, I don't know what to make I agree. of that. But, gentlemen, I thank you all for joining us here yeah. on the Newsmakers. Lee, Tom, and Philip. Thank Thanks you. Again. Still to come, the Bosnian Serb leader says the UK is meddling in his country's upcoming elections. Is this a real threat or a fake crisis? And allegations of torture in Yemen. Is the United Arab Emirates operating black sites? And has the US known about them? I believe that the West wants to have servile people here, that is maybe acceptable humanly, even politically, but I think that it is needed to respect the sovereignty and legitimacy of the elected representatives. I'm not for the politics of imposing the solutions by foreigners. I'm clear about that. The UK says it will send 40 of its troops to Bosnia-Herzegovina to prevent foreign meddling in October's elections. Bosnian Serb leader Milorad Dodik condemned the move, saying it's actually London that's trying to interfere with his country's vote. Meanwhile, Russia says the UK is making indirect accusations of foul play against the Kremlin. But Britain has fired back, saying Dodik is trying to win votes by inventing fake threats to stir nationalist sentiment. And the UK warned he could be hurting UK-Bosnian relations. So is the UK trying to intimidate Serbs in Bosnia? Or is Russia the real threat to a fair, fair vote? Well, joining me to debate this is Rauf Bayerovic. He is Bosnia-Herzegovina's former energy minister. In London is Nevin Angelic, author of the book Bosnia-Herzegovina, The End of a Legacy. And in Moscow, we have former Russian diplomat Vyacheslav Matusov. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us here on the Newsmakers. Nevin Angelic, let me begin with you. Is Milorad Dodic inventing a fake UK threat? I think he's uh, blowing it uh, out of proportion. Uh, the threat uh, might be in the assistance uh, coming from London on the rule of law and uh, uh, liberal uh, democratic uh, uh, leg uh, legacy that uh, uh, doesn't play well with his pre-electoral plans. Uh, so uh, if you look at the numbers, uh, right now there are only six uh, uh, officers in the uh, U4 uh, force uh, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, six officers from the UK, and the announcement, uh, public announcement, that there will be uh, additional 40 added uh, to this force uh, is uh, something that uh, should be understood as a kind of normal procedure or ambition by the United Kingdom to play active role in the Balkans, in Bosnia-Herzegovina in particular, in future when they foresee a future without European Union. Okay, so Rauf Bayerovic, if Dodik is doing this for votes, as is the claim by the British Embassy in Bosnia, let me ask you, you know the system, you know how the game is played there, would he actually get more votes from among Bosnian Serbs by going down this, this route and creating a threat that the UK is trying to undermine the election. Mr. Dodik is desperate. And in desperate times, people do things that don't seem uh, logical or rational to uh, any independent observer. So he's basically trying to find a way to take off the agenda the catastrophic results of his last 12 years in government. Uh, and he has really nothing to show for his 12 years of rule in Bosnia's smaller entity called the IRS. Uh, his claims are ridiculous. I agree with uh, the British Embassy uh, statement and the position of the Foreign Office, which is a logical one and a completely truthful one. Uh, Mr. Dodik is said to have a very tough time ahead, uh, and he's going to try to do anything to uh, show himself as the main client of Vladimir Putin in the Balkans and attacking uh, a very symbolic and normal engagement by the British government in this region is part of that wider strategy of um, trying to uh, cozy up to Mr. Putin and maybe get uh, additional funding from the Russian government which would enable him to 
actually uh, keep going politically. Let's ask the former Russian diplomat if that's true, Vyacheslav Matusov. We've heard Peter Ivanov, the Russian ambassador to Bosnia, also say that the UK is meddling. Is this what's happening? Dodik is trying to cozy himself up to Russia and to demonize the West in that process. Does that stick? Well, uh, you, you know, today it's very difficult to, uh, to watch any election in America, in Great Britain, in Europe, because we have internet, we have uh, uh, social net work. Uh, I think that any person, not government, any person can interfere into electoral process. What uh, position of Russia can I see from Moscow? Uh, because of uh, really uh, threat of inter intervention, foreign intervention in local domestic affairs in uh, Bosnia, in uh, Britain, in the uh, United States, Russia is blamed as a main threat for electoral process in all over the world. Do you consider that Russia is such kind of power that can influence for election of American president, for example? Donald Trump is elected not by Vladimir Putin. He's elected by American people. Ambassador Matusov, so, can I ask you, sorry to interrupt you, let me ask you. So, you know, you're saying that the Russians are being blamed for this and that maybe Dodik has a point saying that, you know, the UK is, is actually a threat. But let me ask you then, given the nature of Bosnia-Herzegovina and the nature of the presidency, the tripartite system, why aren't we seeing any complaints or warnings from the Croats or the Bosniaks? Why are we only hearing it from Dodik and the Serbs who want to be closer to Russia? I think that the president himself knows very well the threat that he is feeling. If he says that this threat is coming from the Great Britain, I think that it is uh, his view from the point of Russia. Uh, I think that any decision made by Bosnian people are right. And Russia will take any, uh, uh, any, any figure, political figure in uh, this state, in European state, because Russia is interested not in uh, struggle, not in the clashes, political, military clashes in, Europe, in, in the neighbor of the European countries, but stability. Okay. Main point of what Russia okay. is Russia bothered of is stability okay. of all governments, Let me existing ask, governments. Okay, let me ask Nevin. Nevin Angelic, do you accept that argument from the Russian perspective? They don't want to meddle. They don't want to steer it or bend it in any way. They just want Bosnia-Herzegovina to have a free and fair election. I mean, this is what uh, all diplomats of any country would uh, have to say and would uh, be saying. We can hear it uh, coming uh, from any kind of source, from any, any kind of government. But uh, we should, uh, let me just remind the viewers that uh, basically Milorad Dodik uh, 20 years ago was darling of the West, not of Russia, but darling of the West. Uh, he was the guy that the West played on uh, in Bosnia Herzegovina, in particular uh, among uh, Bosnian uh, Serb ethnic community. And uh, he changed. Uh, he shifted his allegiance and he's uh, uh, looking for uh, 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 somebody who would sponsor him, who would uh, support him. He's uh, offering himself as a client. Uh, and uh, uh, I think there is uh, more interest uh, uh, in Dodik uh, uh, finding uh, uh, someone to protect him outside because he lost this uh, protection uh, from the West uh, and uh, he's offering himself to Russia. I'm not sure that Russia has that much influence. Uh, the only, uh, uh, the, sorry, not influence, but interest uh, uh, in Dodik. The, the, the only interest might be to, to make the West busy in this uh, broader geopolitical uh, uh, situation when there is a kind of uh, ongoing confrontation between the West and the Russia, between different kinds of regimes that are in place in Western liberal democracies and in uh, uh, increasingly authoritarian regime of illiberal democracy in Russia. I'm not saying one is better than the other. Uh, we can find examples of uh, illiberal democracy elsewhere in the world. And uh, uh, there is a, a global contest that is ongoing and uh, Dodik is trying to play it to his own advantage. I'm not sure it is going to be successful, but uh, it is attracting interest uh, from both uh, Great Britain uh, or the West uh, in general and also uh, from Russia. So, Reuf, U4's Operation Althea 
at the center of this debate because the UK wanted to boost its presence within that. And as was mentioned earlier, there's just a handful of them right now and they want to add 40 to it. Has it worked? Has Doddick's claim made any impact? And are we seeing the U4 mission, I guess, tarnished in any way? Are people questioning their presence in the country from all communities? Well, the, their presence is really not questioned uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, Bosnia uh, gained peace 23 years ago thanks to the very uh, robust engagement of the United States uh, and the Western states. Uh, later on, the Blair government, uh, the Brown government, uh, Cameron, and now May, May cabinet are uh, very much uh, doing the same thing uh, in the last 21 years. Namely, Britain's interest here, uh, the way that is being understood in the region, is to keep things uh, from going backwards. So sending 40 soldiers is not going to change dynamics on the ground fundamentally, but it is a sort of a tripwire force which does not mean uh, that it would be used as an effective deterrence, uh, which is necessary under the Dayton Peace Accords. However, it is a very commendable move by uh, Theresa May and her Ministry of Defense. Um, I don't think Dodik really gained much traction electorally with this yet. Uh, this is an issue that is being played up by uh, the media under his control, played up by the media under the control of the Russian government which in many ways is very effective in spreading its message. And I would agree with uh, what Mr. Angelic said. Uh, there is a contest, there is a global contest between states uh, led by Russia on one side and the uh, states uh, of the Western world, the liberal democratic world, uh, which is being played out here in the Balkans as well. Uh, Balkans has had the unfortunate um, circumstance that it was very often a playground which uh, was first used to te test certain uh, ideas by the uh, West and as well as by the uh, Eastern empires throughout history and was always the victim of, of such games. Mm -hmm. um, this time around it'd be very wise if people in the Balkans, the citizens, uh, would decide to actually take a pass to basically let this conflict go on without any involvement by the states in the Balkans. Uh, I am somewhat skeptical that that, right. would ha that that will actually happen because there are some incentives uh, for, for lo the local elites to co try to you know, play up their connections to the Russian government or to, to governments outside the region, other governments outside the region. And I think that basically the West has underestimated Vladimir Putin in the Balkans and, 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 and in Europe in general. Okay, and for many people, this very debate could be an indication of just how unresolved things are, despite Dayton and after Dayton, in the Balkans right now. We look forward to a free and fair election on October the 7th. We'll be watching Bosnia-Herzegovina very closely, but for the moment I have to thank all of you. Nevin Angelic, Rauf Bayrovic and Vyacheslav Matuzov, I thank you all for joining us here on the Newsmakers. <music> Yemen's interior minister has been highly critical of the United Arab Emirates. He accuses the UAE of torturing people detained in secret prisons in Yemen, something UAE officials flat out deny. They say they don't control any such facilities. But in recent weeks, the Associated Press has reported on the sexual and physical abuse at locations ranging from Emirati-run military bases to a nightclub operated by a UAE commander. Mixed up in the allegations is the United States, which reportedly has interrogated Al-Qaeda suspects at these facilities. So, is the UAE guilty of torturing Yemenis? And is the U.S. complicit? Here's Natalie Pohonen. This is Yemeni actor Nasser al-Anbari when he was released from prison last month. He was held without charge for nearly a year in a facility controlled by the United Arab Emirates. But the prison wasn't in the UAE. It was in Yemen. In a series of reports, the Associated Press has described the torture and sexual abuse of hundreds of detainees who have been held in at least 18 secret prisons in the country's south. The men were taken there on suspicion of being members of Daesh or Al-Qaeda. They were held without charge. 
Family members have repeatedly called for their relatives to be released, a plea that had been largely ignored until this week. Yemen's interior minister has now demanded the UAE shut down or hand over the clandestine prisons under its control. In January, the UN Security Council's panel of experts on Yemen said UAE forces at a number of facilities were responsible for the torture, ill-treatment and the enforced disappearance of detainees. It said the continued denial of its role in arbitrary arrests and detentions contributes to violations occurring with impunity by both United Arab Emirates forces and its Yemeni proxies. The UAE is a key ally of the US in its fight against Al-Qaeda and Daesh in Yemen. The Associated Press reported that American forces have been involved in interrogations in Yemen. The US State Department has called for all parties involved to investigate. The UAE denies it has any connection to these facilities. In this tweet, it says it's never managed or run prisons or secret detention centers in Yemen. On Sunday, the UAE State Minister for Foreign Affairs, Anwar Gargash, said, In Yemen, the Emiratis have been subjected to an unjust smear campaign because it bears its responsibility toward regional security with courage and boldness. The UAE has played a critical role in Yemen's three-year war. It's part of the Saudi Arabian-led Sunni coalition that backs President Abd Rabu Mansur Hadi. They're fighting against Shia Houthi rebels who are allied with Iran. So will the UAE answer the demands of the Yemeni government and limit its anti-terror role in the country to the battleground? Or will this be a cause of more tension between the allies? Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now from London is Yemeni MP and former Health Minister Najib Ghanim. In Sana'a is Yemeni journalist Hussein al Bukhaiti. And in New York, we have Michael Page, the Deputy Director of the Middle East and North Africa Division at Human Rights Watch. Michael, let me start with you. Is it clear to you that the United Arab Emirates is torturing people in Yemen? Yes, I mean, it's clear that they're committing a series of human rights violations in their informal detention facilities and via the proxy forces that they support and direct in Yemen. Human Rights Watch in 2017 documented approximately 49 cases of arbitrary detentions and enforced disappearances in southern Yemen in Aden and Hadramaut uh, governorates by either UAE security forces or in UAE-run or UAE-supported detention facilities. In these facilities, the UAE, we found, has tortured, mistreated, uh, and held without any kind of ability to communicate uh, detainees for periods of months or longer. And so, yeah, I think it's I think it's fair to say that, uh, like other actors in Yemen, including the Houthis, the UAE is committing a series of abuses with regards to its detention facilities. Okay, so Hossein, 18 secret prisons, including Wadah nightclub, Wadah nightclub, turned into a prison. It's an extraordinary uh, AP investigation. I urge people to to sort of have a look at it online. When you read that, Hossein. What did you make of it? What did it tell you about the nature of the conflict right now? And also, who do you think is being tortured by the Emiratis, if it's true? Uh, when we uh, saw this uh, report from uh, uh, Associate uh, Press, uh, it was really uh, sad to see that the only, uh, that, that to get this message out from this prison, that they use this plastic uh, plate uh, to write uh, something. I have smuggled this, and uh, to be honest, that uh, even before this uh, report uh, was released, uh, we have seen many uh, protests from families, uh, family members of, of these uh, prisoners, especially from their wives, their uh, daughters, their sisters, uh, in the street of Aden and in uh, in uh, in. Abu Anazul and Hadramaut. They all demand uh, the release of their sons, or at least to take if there is anything wrong, uh, anything wrong they have done, they have to take them like through uh, the court uh, the court system and to see the amount of it. And as well, at the same time, the secreties, uh, uh, I mean, how secret the United Arab Emirates have so many uh, prisons uh, across uh, across uh, Yemen, uh, torturing people, mm -hmm. doing whatever uh, they want to do. And, and mainly, to be honest, they are targeting uh, the one 
who are in their coalition, the one who are uh, loyal uh, to uh, the, the Saudi-led coalition, especially uh, the Islahi party, as we call them, uh, the Muslim uh, Brotherhood. And I think if I was Islahi, this was actually add uh, insult into injury. How come that we came into coalition, as they say, to liberate Yemen uh, from what they called uh, the Houthis, and at the same time, you are doing such things okay. to those people who, who have helped you, to those people who have okay. brought you to the country. Okay, so let's pose this question. Najib Ghanim, we've had you on the show before. You defend the coalition, you support the coalition, you're anti-Houthi, you're anti what you call the coup, and yet there's documented evidence based on the best available evidence out there in estimation, this seems to be legitimate, that there's terrible rape and torture happening in Yemeni prisons run by coalition partner, the UAE. Does it embarrass you? Does it upset you as a coalition supporter? Yes, thank you really for this invitation. Really, I'm also very, uh, you know, very sad and also very disappointed about all these reports. I mean, as is uh, coming from AB and also from SAM organization, but really, uh, also, this gives also, you know, just, you know, clear-cut evidence that uh, Islam members and also other, you know, uh, you know, those who are working in, in favor of the government, legitimate government, they are going to be, you know, double price. One price by Houthis, prisoners, and uh, secret prisoners in Sana'a, and also in so many areas under the control of the coup militias, Houthis coup militias, and also, unfortunately, also by those security belts in some areas in Aden and also in Al Mukalla. But really, one just one point really just Bukhaiti uh, just gave us the impression that they are as if Houthis are innocent people. But really, who Houthis who are started these sort of tortures and these or I mean, just kidnapping people and give, you know, secret. Uh, they initiate so many prisoners, okay. I mean, secret but prisoners also. Najib, let me, uh, let me ask Hussein our, about our that in members, a moment. I mean, all... Okay, fair enough. Let me, ask, mm -hmm. let me ask Hussein about that in a moment, and I will ask him about it, right? But let me ask you, when you actually read the details of the report, when we read that they raped detainees while other guards filmed the assaults, that's very much beyond Abu Ghraib in many ways. They electrocuted prisoners' genitals, hung rocks from their testicles, right? sexually violated people with wooden and, and steel poles. So as somebody who supports the coalition, if this is happening and there's evidence that this is happening, at what point do you say, I cannot accept the help of the UAE if they are running black sites like this? They don't mean well in my country. Yes, really, I agree that uh, uh, we have to differentiate between these two parallel things. Also, we, we admit we will not accept all these things. Nobody will accept, I mean, torturing innocent people. And even if some people are the committed crimes, they should be transferred to court. But really, yes, nobody will accept all these things. As human being, nobody will accept torturing people, despite their color, origin, uh, religion, and also these, his backgrounds. Uh, but really, again, this is, this is the way we are, we are raising, this is the way we are chairing. We are waiting for the legitimate government to interfere, to stop these, you know, you know agony in, in, in our people whether they are Islah and also other Islah members, uh, Salafis and all and, and others, so many, so many journalists. But as I said, two main parties are working in this, in this respect, the Houthis in the northern areas, and also the you know, security belts and also these Okay, elite, but do you still support the UAE? Do you still support the UAE? Do you still support the UAE in Yemen? The UAE in, in Yemen, on the ground, their forces beside our, you know, uh, governmental forces, they are working very good, you know, on the ground. But also in the same time, you know, the militias, you know, supported by UAE, as I said, I mean, security builds in Aden, we have, they have so many secret prisoners, and this is documented by some organization, mm -hmm. with so many documents you know, released by, by those people, and also in, in, in Hadramut as well. Okay. So in, in Rayyan Air Force and, and okay. elsewhere. So, so really, okay. this is the other, the other, okay. the other bad story. Of, of, you of say the, the militias are doing this, and, but you still broadly support the UAE. Hossein, to the point made by Najib Ghanim that the Houthis also torture people, and everybody is doing it in this terrible and ugly war. Would you accept that? Uh, of course, I'm not here like to uh, deny, neither to confirm, uh, to confirm uh, this. Uh, but uh, today is like is about what UAE is doing. But it's really was strange. I mean, of course, there are reports about uh, torture. 
uh, as uh, as said in some report like uh, done uh, by uh, by uh, by the houthi uh, but uh, i mean just let's let rephrase the question if there is a report about the houthi for example uh, targeting uh, the rifles uh, on the other hand you see united arab emirates targeting their allies targeting the one who who, who were the, the the main part in their allies on the ground, which is the Islahi party, the Muslim Brotherhood. And it's really, really strange to see, um, to hear Mr. Najib Ghanim. He has mentioned the Houthi, I think, five to six times. And he hasn't mentioned the United Arab Emirates. Okay, he was trying that, to, like, to okay, go all Hussain, the way around it to, and to, to mention, to give the man clear, credit, does Hussain. the United Arab Emirates to, torture totally. people, he yes or the, no? He, he hasn't denied that it's happening, unlike the UAE government, which has denied that it's happening. They've actually called it fake news. And even yeah, the know. Pentagon, right, Hussein, and this, I want to pivot to the U.S. here and bring Michael in again. This is the Pentagon. They say we have no credible allegations uh, that would substantiate the allegations put forth in your question and story. Under no circumstances did DOD personnel participate in violations of human rights. Additionally, as a matter of policy, they are required to report credible allegations of detainee abuse through established reporting procedures. This coming from the Pentagon... Michael, when you heard that or read that, you must have been pretty, I, I don't know, disgusted by that. I mean, it's hard, it's hard to believe that uh, U.S. personnel, U.S. government, I mean, the U.S. government has said that not only is it uh, working with the UAE in terms of collecting intelligence in Yemen, but it also has participated in interrogations. The amount of documentation that's now been put forth uh, on UAE abuses, from the Associated Press article that you mentioned, from Human Rights Watch, from local Yemeni organizations, from lawyers and activists, at this point seems uh, too big to deny. I mean, one of the things that I think is very important is that there is simply no transparency around even the kind of number of detention facilities that the UAE either supports or runs exclusively. And I think, in particular, the U.S. Congress needs to play a much stronger role in demanding transparency from a key U.S. ally uh, in Yemen, right. in which it's committing serious abuses so that they don't themselves become complicit in such abuses and serious violations of international humanitarian law. Michael, there have been reports of Americans and Colombians even at Buraika base. These reports came through. Might it be that the U.S. is saying nothing happening here because they might actually be involved in this. Is that plausible? It's possible. From our documentation, we don't have evidence of that. So we can only kind of uh, uh, base our work or base our claims on what we've been able to document. But that's certainly a concern. I mean, I think what we would say is that the U.S. needs to make, needs to ensure that they are not even uh, complicit to any degree. They need to ensure, and the way that they can do that is transparency on what their actual role is, what their forces are doing in Yemen, how they're coordinating with the UAE, and then pushing the UAE to stop, you know, repeating these blanket denials about their abuses. And if I could mention one other thing, uh -huh. the UAE hasn't even just been uh, uh, involved in detention abuses in terms of Yemenis. It's also had a role in horrific uh, abuses at a migrant detention facility that was recently closed in Aden. Mm -hmm. And this was UAE backed forces of Yemeni, uh, Yemeni forces uh, rounding up migrants, putting them in a detention center. The detention center former head coordinating with the uh, UAE and the coalition, according to multiple sources. And then uh, and we're seeing horrific abuse right. of migrants, that is, right. rape of women, of boys, of of killing uh, migrants. And so I, I would say is that with that amount of evidence, the U.S. needs to step up now, and in particular, Congress needs to do its job in terms of pushing for transparency and clarity in what they're actually doing, what the UAE is doing. Okay, got it. So, Najib, we have your interior minister, Ahmed al maisri who, who almost broke rank, right, and, and has been upset and has criticized the UAE. Despite that, despite the evidence, despite the, the, the fact that the interior minister is criticizing you know, these alleged secret torture camps. We have Anwar uh, Gargash, the UAE State Minister for Foreign Affairs, basically saying all these reports are just fake news. Is he wrong? He seems to be in denial. Is he wrong? I mean, based, based on what already been released by some organization, also by Associated Press, 
now really it is it looks really very obvious that it's a clear-cut evidence that there is secret prisoners there is tortures there is detained in and in hiding uh, uh, you know places so I think yes completely yes he's he's not right he's not on the right way to, to say like this but really what really we are very upset that we would like to see our government our legitimate government to interfere first of all to stop this I mean mm -hmm. torturing to stop, I mean, hiding those prisoners and just to release them. Right. If somebody documented with committed crimes, they should send to, to the court, I mean, just for okay. fair, you know, judgment. But uh, before that, really, we are very, very sorry and okay. upset about what is going on in Aden and also in Sana'a and also in all, all, all over, okay. you know, where there is, you know, as either militia at Houthi in, in, in northern areas or these, you know, security belts and also elite forces in, in elsewhere in the southern area. Okay, so Hussein, the man sincerely criticizing what's happening there. I know you've disagreed with him on this program now and before. Would you give credit where it's due and accept his argument here? Uh, yeah, I mean, of course, now, like, I agree, agree with him that he, he actually said that, uh, that the government should uh, take uh, a stand, and this is a good uh, step. Uh, but uh, at one side, uh, uh, the Islahi party should take uh, uh, a clear step if the government is not going to do anything, which I, do, I don't believe that Hadi uh, can, can do anything because he's under the control of the Saudi United Arab Emirates, then Islahi party should take a clear stand because those prisons mainly t targeting their members. They should be like, uh, I mean, uh, make a stand uh, uh, and request. The same they did uh, about those claims done, uh, done uh, uh, by the Houthi. I mean, they have uh, requested the government. The government has sent uh, uh, the Hadi government has sent like a request into the UN many times saying about the torture done in Sana'a and all this. Why they, why they are not doing this to, 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 uh, to ask the coalition? Why they are keeping to be, have to be nice to the right. United Arab Emirates? Okay. It's not only about torture. There are imams uh, that are assassinated uh, almost on a weekly basis because they are members of the Islahi party. Okay. And this is the question. Okay, got it, Hussein. We're out of time. I think this was a fascinating discussion, and I appreciate you all coming on to the newsmakers, Najib Ghanim, Hussein al bukhaiti and Michael Page. Thanks for joining us. And that's all for this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. You can check out more of our stories on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Remember to like, follow, and subscribe. Next time, Italy threatens to expel thousands of Roma from the country. We go to the heart of the story and speak to the persecuted minority. Until then, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.